Hey guys and girls, welcome back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we're in our, like, I guess our first actual uh, puzzly thing. We did it last time around. Uh, we got the Mars key. We're gonna open up the big double doors. Yes! It unlocked. Good job, Junpei. Good. Now we can keep going. Come on, what are you guys standing around for? Let's get out of here. Come on, Jumpy. Let's go. All right, let's go. And we're continuing through. We finished our escape. Uh, our second escape thing, mission thingy. They step through the door to find themselves in a wide hallway. Junpei, Jun, Lotus, and Santa stopped for a moment and looked at their surroundings. A short distance away, a metal grate extended across the width of the hallway. They took hold and shook, but it refused to move. Nearby was a pair of elevators. It took only a few button presses to determine that the elevators would not respond to their efforts. They could only assume the elevators were not powered. There was only one door left. Well... Looks like we don't have any choice. Yeah. Sure it does. Well then, let's open it. Junpei grabbed hold of the knob and quietly pushed the door open. He entered slowly, trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he could. The others followed shortly. Oh, so it's a kitchen. Santa did not look pleased. What were you expecting? Isn't it obvious? The exit. I was hoping this would be the way out of here. Do you really think it'd be that easy? Yeah, yeah, I know. Still. As they talked, Lotus headed deeper into the room. Until at last she stood in front of a door. If we can just get through this door, we should come out on the other side of that grate we saw earlier. We... but don't we need a key for that? We need a card reader, by the looks of that machine. Sorry, I guess that wasn't very constructive. Neither Junpei nor Lotus looked terribly happy. Junpei dug the ship map from his pocket and spread it out in front of him. As he did. Hey! What's that? Huh? Oh, yeah. I guess I forgot to tell you. I found this a little while ago. It's a map of the B-Deck. Before Junpei could finish, Lotus snatched the map away from him. She ran her finger across it, muttering to herself. I knew it. See? Look. Junpei did as he was told. Sans and Jun moved over to look at the map as well. See? We came in here. If we go out there, then we'll be on the other side of the grate. With her finger, Lotus traced a path on the map. She was right. Satisfied that she had been correct, Lotus folded the map and handed it back to Junpei. He took it and slid the valuable piece of paper back into his pocket. There's a card reader on the right side of the door. Then that means the key card is somewhere in here, right? That seems the most likely. Alright, we know what we need to do then. Let's get moving. First off, I say we split up and look for clues. Okay. Alright, our third escape starts now. Finding our way out of this kitchen. Alright. Play for appetizers. Appetizers are usually on square plates. One, two, three. There's ten of them. The middle is super deep for a plate. <laughs> Very true. So there's ten of these plates. Did she say there was ten of these ones? I'm not sure. But those are the there. There are fifteen of the regular plates or salad plates. Any plate from the ninety-nine cent store? <laughs> There's a 
bunch of little wavy ridges on this plate. Those are for serving meat. I feel like I'm gonna have to do something with plates and I really hate it. Uh, what's this? There's a voucher at the end of the counter. This voucher doesn't match the number of plates on the table. It says appetizer, A eh, appetizer nine. Meat dish 10, soup A, seafood dish F on the voucher. And the plates on the table are 9, appetizer 16, meat 10, soup, and 15 for seafood. Maybe they're using hexadecimal. And hexadecimal here it is. It's a number system that goes 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11. You're familiar, familiar with base 10, right? That's the normal system of numbers. The base 10 equivalent for hexadecimal numbers would go like this. A equal 10, B equal 11, C equal 12, D equal 13, E equal F, F equal 15, and 10 equal 16. The 10 becomes 16 is in base minus 10. I know it sounds strange, but you can think of it as just six letters added onto the normal number system after nine. A equal 10, B equal 11, C equal 12, D equal 13, E equal 14, F, F equal 15, 10 equals 16, and so on. I think I get it. I really do not, but okay. Um, so these are the doors. It's a ladle. <laughs> okay. We came in through there, right? Uh, sink. And there's a couple plates in here. What's this? Whetstone. Sharpen something. And the rolling pin here. I mean, these tables for preparing food. There are plates everywhere. Oh, wait, did we look at this? Alright, it's going. Do you think this was all part of Zero's plan? Probably. Kinda hard to believe there's a chef on board somewhere. What are these, like, lines? It's a grill. There's some coal down here. The bright red. I wonder what this drawer is. You see the metal grate on top of the grill? They make it like that so that the fat and juices can drip off the meat while it cooks. I can't pull this out, though. No, it's stuck. The area on the pl under the plate opens up. Oh, it's still shut. Where the coal goes. It doesn't look like we're gonna be able to do anything there. I seen when I turn too that there, there's like some sort of weird thing down here. This an iron oven. We're gonna have to find out what kind of code will get us in here. Currently don't know the number though, like what might be the password. Um, some bottles of seasoning here. Pots and frying pans. Why so serious? the door we came through. Okay, these doors we messed with. Come on, hurry up, hurry up. I got it, I got it. 
Alright. Uh... Cheese. Something behind the cheese. Time to move it. June and I need to look behind you. There's a little green bottle back there. Bottle of oil with a scratch like label sort of cooking oil you could probably use this to make something slippery can i combine it with the whetstone to make it slippery no okay i thought that might be used for something but po possibly not um well we'll hold on to that then gouda cheese the most famous if you don't cut open the casing it usually won't go bad so you can store it at room temperature. <sighs> Pantry. There's the knife. A rusty knife. I don't think we'll be able to use it while it's like this. The knife seemed important, Junpei thought, but it was going to be much it wasn't going to be much use to the way it was. It's futile. Futile. You know, a waste. Useless. Pointless. Oh. Um any particular reason you wanted to bring that up? Oh, no reason really. I was just thinking about futility. She wasn't making much sense. Junpei tried rephrasing his question. Why were you thinking about futility? At last she answered. Well, it has something to do with the Titanic. The Titanic? Yep. Have you ever heard the story that the sinking of the Titanic was predicted? I have not. No, I haven't. What is it? In 1892, 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novel was published. It was called Futility. It was written by an American novelist named Morgan Robertson. The story was about a big cruise ship colliding with an iceberg and sinking. Of course, if that was the only similarity, there wouldn't be any reason to mention it. It wasn't, though. The name of the ship, its nationality, course departure time, size displacement, maximum speed, number of passengers and crew, the number of lifeboats, even the location of the accident itself and the cause of the, the location. So that's crazy. It is an actual real book, though it wasn't the Titanic. It's it was called the Titan, but um, it was pretty dead on, I guess, in the North Atlantic and everything, huh? <sighs> everything matches the Titanic almost exactly. It was almost as if he'd seen the whole thing happen. But this book was written 14 years before the Titanic sank. But that's not all. It wasn't just futility that predicted the sinking of the Titanic. There were two other similar stories written by a man named William Thomas Steed, both of them before the accident. One in 1886 and one in 1892. Steed wrote two stories that had striking similarities to the Titanic disaster. In one, two ships collided and many of the passengers died because there weren't enough lifeboats. In the other, a ship collided with an iceberg and sank. Hmm. I don't know, I mean, I'll give you that, it seems a little weird, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't too uncommon for ships to hit icebergs back in the day. Or even other ships. Right. I knew you'd say that. Huh? But what if Steed had some sort of special power? To be more specific, what if he had the ability to do automatic writing? What? Automatic writing? Wait, are you... are you talking about that thing where someone says they're possessed by a spirit? And then they write a bunch of stuff without knowing what they're writing? Yes. What do you mean, yes? That stuff's a load of bull. But Jumpy, you said you believed in curses. Come on, that's totally different. Okay, so let's say hypothetically that automatic writing is in a total load. These guys still couldn't have predicted the sinking of the Titanic. When the steed dude wrote his thing, nobody had died on the Titanic yet. So if automatic writing is about being possessed by spirits of dead people, who the hell possessed him so he could write that stuff? That's not it. What's not it? Steed wasn't possessed by a spirit. 
He was doing the possessing. What are you smoking? William Thomas Steed was a passenger on the Titanic. He just wrote down what he saw with his own eyes. 20 years before it happened. Okay, I'm confused now. He decided it was probably best to say nothing. What June was saying was insane and utterly absurd. If he tried to take what she was saying seriously, he'd go mad. Junpei smiled uncomfortably. Well, uh... Why don't we talk about this some other time, okay? Huh? But... Her voice trailed off, it, and she glanced at the floor, troubled. Junpei tapped Jun gently on the shoulder and awkwardly reached around her to pick up the knife from the box. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. She's she she's really into stuff. Maybe I'll use the whetstone to sharpen the knife. Oh wait, no, I have to oil it first, don't I? It's getting sharper by the second. I should be able to cut something pretty good with this. Oh, okay, never mind. I thought I did. Okay, so I can cut something with that now, which is good. Um, that's probably what we came in there for. And we could use the knife to... What would we have to cut? Can I, like, maybe pull something open? The drawer seems to be stuck. It won't open. We're ready to grill. Trash can. There's nothing inside it. Oh wait, this is cooking oil. Can I use it on the grill? Maybe? No, no, no. Hmm. I have to figure this out. about this door. This bolt is rusted. It won't budge. I put some oil. Okay, so the oil worked for this. Just a little bit of oil in. Come on. Come on, you little son of a bitch. Whoa. Yes, got you, you little bastard. You did it, Jumpy. You're so smart. Nice. Get in here now. As Junpei walked into the room, a blast of cold air washed over him. Almost instinctively, he folded his arms tight across his chest, doing what he could to conserve body heat. <laughs> it's cold in here. What is this place? Are you blind? It's a freezer. Santa's teeth had already begun to chatter. Hardly surprising. The freezer was far too cold for someone dressed as he was. 
Lotus, however, was in an even worse situation. No way. That's way too code for me. I'll free solid in seconds. Sorry, but I'm afraid I'll have to pass on this one. I'm going to leave the rest to you. And with that, she ran out of the room. As Lotus left, June came in. It's really cold in here. White puffs of steam hovered in front of their faces as they, as they talked. June had already started to shiver. Hey, you don't need to be in here. We had a fever just a little while ago. You should stay outside. We got this. No, I'm fine. My fever's gone now. But... Junpei had scarcely opened his mouth. When the thunderous sound of metal upon metal rang out from behind them, in unison they spun around to find that the door they had only recently come through, oh no, was closed. Oh no! Junpei rushed to the door. It's frozen. Desperately, he grabbed hold of the doorknob. Now! It was cold beyond cold. Merely touching it was painful. The doorknob had, had been frozen solid. They quickly deduced that the pipe next to the door had ruptured. Water released by the rupture had hit the door and frozen it instantly. Santa shoved Junpei aside and pounded against the door. Hey, Lotus! You're out there, right? Open the door! She wasted no time in responding. What do you want? What's going on? The door won't open. Try opening it from that side. Please. Ugh, fine. If you say so. Hold on. Soon they could hear Lotus on the other side of the door. Ugh. 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 Then the grunting ceased and they could hear light panting. As if from exertion. It's no use. It won't budge. You've got more people in there. You figure it out. Santa was shaking like a newborn deer. June was hugging herself and was shivering violently. Even Junpei, with the heaviest clothes of any of them, was clearly feeling cold. With every breath they took, they could feel the cold working its way deeper and deeper into their bodies. Anyway, let's find a way out. If we don't keep moving, we're going to be permanent residents. T two heads are better than none. I'm sure we'll figure something out. Y yeah, you're right. Let's just take a good look around this room. Right. They pushed in close to one another and began to search. Damn. This thing's frozen solid. It's pork. It looks like a tag. Chunk of pork. I'm gonna have to probably cut that. But I wanna look around a bit more before we do that. Frozen chicken. Dry ice. Jinpei picked up the dry ice with his sleeves so as to avoid burning himself. Dry ice is just frozen carbon dioxide, right? Yeah, it is. I wonder how warm it has to get for it to turn back into gas again. Hell if I know. How's that gonna help us anyway? Well, I figured we might be able to get... We, we might be able to use it to get out of here. They were about to move on when June spoke up. Carbon dioxide's sublimation point is... Negative 109 degrees. Any warmer than that, and it'll turn into gas. Any lower, and it becomes a solid. Junpei looked at her dumbfounded. How do you know that? Tee <laughs> Despite my looks, I'm the... him <laughs> The queen of random... Knowledge. Looks bad to mess up when you're showing off. Oh, you're so cold your mouth's going numb? Yes. Yes. That's why. You're just doing that on purpose, aren't you? June giggled and did her best to hide her guilt, at least. She was still feeling good enough to joke around, Junpei told himself. Come on, guys, don't you think that's kind of weird? I wonder why it doesn't turn into a, a liquid first. Santa was now shivering at an astounding rate, but his curiosity seemed unaffected. Junpei, however, was not in a mood to discuss science. Yeah. 
It did seem rather odd to Junpei, and he couldn't help but think about it. June answered, But it can turn into a liquid. Carbon dioxide turns to liquid if you put it under high enough pressure. But at one atmosphere, no atmosphere normal air pressure, it won't turn into a liquid, right? That's right. Instead of melting it, it'll do what's called sublimating and change. Immediately from a solid state to a gaseous one. See, that that is weird. Water is a liquid between 32 degrees. 32 degrees and 212 degrees. So why isn't that the case for carbon dioxide? June replied with an answer that stunned both of them. There's a kind of ice that doesn't turn into liquid when it goes above th 32 degrees. I... I heard about it. Its melting point is 96 degrees. Ice with a melting point of 96 degrees? You mean there's water that freezes at 96 degrees? Yeah. Well, you could also look at it as ice that won't melt until it's 96 degrees. Water that freezes at 96 degrees? Ice that won't melt until it's 96 degrees? Jubei was cold as hell, but this was too interesting to ignore. He did his best to warm up by rubbing his arms and, and stamping his feet, then putting the question to June. So what's this ice with a melting point of 96 degrees called? I heard it's called Ice 9. Ice 9? Originally, Ice 9 was a made-up substance invented by a science fiction author. But recently, scientists have discovered that such a substance actually exists. Wait. Hold up. So is this thing called Ice 9? Or is it water? Like I said, if the ice is over 96 degrees, it'll be liquid. If it's under that, it'll solidify. So you can think of it as a polymorph of H2O. Here, think of it like diamonds and graphite. They're both made of carbon, right? But depending on the structure of the crystallization, the hardness and structure are completely different. So you're saying normal water and this ice line are like... that? Yep. She wasn't finished. Have you heard the story about the crystallization of glycerin? For 150 years, after the discovery of glycerin, people cooled it, warmed it, and did all sorts of things to it. But whatever they did, it never crystallized. However, one day in 1920, some glycerin that was en route to England by ship was discovered to have crystallized during the trip. Naturally, scientists worldwide wanted to research this new crystallized form of glycerin and began asking for samples of the seed. A seed is, of course, a sample of the original crystallized substance. With the seed crystal, further crystallization of glycerin would be a simple matter. However, something very strange happened. Not only did the glycerin encouraged by seed crystals begin to crystallize, nearby samples did as well. It didn't end there. After that day, all glycerin in the world began to crystallize naturally when cooled to less than 64 degrees. Before that day, no matter how glycerin was cooled, it refused to crystallize. But once the crystallization had begun, it was almost like, how do I put it? It was almost like all the glycerin in the world was communicating, communicating in some way that we can't sense. Junpei. I was honestly impressed. It was, in fact, a pretty interesting story. Wow. That's pretty interesting. But, uh, what does that have to do with Ice Nine? To a surprise, it was Santa and not June who answered. What she's saying is that it's a lot like Ice Nine. What happened? I mean, a lot like? That would be bad. If water everywhere started freezing at 96 degrees, man, it'd be the end of the world. Jimpe felt that Santa might not be treating the idea of the end of the world with proper concern. At any rate, we're not going to have to worry about the end of the world unless we can get out of here pretty damn quick. He was right. Junpei shivered. Alright guys, I think that's enough of that. I didn't think we'd get quite this far off topic. I mean, I know I'm kind of at fault here, but we can't be screwing around anymore. Seriously. I might go by the name Santa right now, but I didn't grow up in Iceland. I freaking hate the cold. So let's get cracking, alright? We gotta find a way out of here. Santa slumped off, clearly doing his best to pretend the cold wasn't affecting him. Selfish, isn't he? Thought Junpei to himself. Still, Santa was right, and it was high time they got back to their search. The story of Einstein had him interested, but there'd be time to think about that once they'd gotten out of the freezer. Junpei lo looked at June, nodded, and resumed his search of the room. It's pretty interesting, but... 
We gotta keep looking. We gotta figure out what to do. Uh, what's this? Got a water bottle. Sturdy rope. I don't think there's anything else in here, is there? Okay. Alright, we got a lot of stuff that we're probably gonna have to mess with combining. Um, can I cut the rope with the knife? No. I'm not using the water for anything. Can I do anything with the rope with these things? No, I can't. Alright. So we got a water bottle that's like super frozen y. Can't use that for nothing. Chunk of pork. I feel like I have to use the knife with the pork. Oh, damn it. Thought I'd be able to cut it out. A rope. But we could use it to attach something to something else, I suppose. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Alright, um... There's a slip of paper in that. I think there's something written on here, but I can't read it like this. If you try and pull it out, it'll probably rip. You need to defrost that. I don't think we're gonna be doing that in this room. Oh, that we might need to hold on to. It's really hard. It's frozen stiff. Hey, June, can you say that again? Eh? Say it again. It's really hard? Again. It's really hard. <laughs> Th thanks. Something wrong, Junpei? Your face is bright red. N nothing. I'm fine. If it's that hard, you can probably use it as a hammer. Yeah, good point. Maybe we can use it to break something. Oh, wait. The dry ice. Alright, the dry ice is all in pieces now. So... Wow, you crushed it up really good. You should be able to get into anything you want now. Can't you make that stuff cause an explosion if you seal it in something that's airtight? Yeah, the water bottle. I'm gonna put these pieces of dry ice into the water bottle. Alright. And then, if we use this with the water bottle, let's just tie a rope on here. Okay. Um, now, I'm drawing at straws here, but can we use that? No, we can't. Alright, so... Can we use this on this now? Warm water dripped from the ruptured pipe near the door. Junpei pulled out the water bottle filled with dry ice, let a good amount of water fall in, and then quickly sealed it up tight. The makeshift bomb complete. He tied it to the doorknob as quickly as he could. Alright, that's set. So, uh, what do we do now? We just need to give it a little uh, tap. The bottle's already about to pop. If we just throw a rock or something at it, it'll go off all on its own. A small rock? A small rock. Jumbe looked down at the floor. Scattered across it were pieces of dry ice left over from the large chunk he crushed. Alright, this ought to do the trick. He pulled his sleeve down over his hand to keep it from getting burned. He grabbed a chunk of dry ice. It was a pretty good size. About as big as a pool ball. He figured it would be just about the right size. Alright guys, stand back. Actually, we should probably hide somewhere. Both Santa and June looked at him with new concern. Where exactly do you expect us to hide, genius? There isn't really anywhere big enough. Oh, inside that hole, right? Yeah, there is. Look, right here. We can hide in there. Jinbei pulled open the door to the small cellar. Yeah. Come on, get inside quick. Santa and June nodded and jumped down into the hole. Jinbei quickly followed. In his hand, he could feel the chill of the frozen carbon dioxide, even though his sleeve... Even, even though his sleeve... Even through his sleeve, he tightened his grip, took aim, and prepared to throw. Alright, here it goes. Three, four, five. You're cutting the wrong way. O oops. Uh, that is a really sad excuse for a joke, man. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Alright, for real this time. 
You guys ready? Yes. Whenever you're ready. Just throw the damn thing. Alright, here we go. Three, two, one. Junpei threw the chunk of dry ice as hard as he could. With the same motion, he ducked down into the cellar with Santa and June, just as... Junpei leapt up out of the cellar and ran to the door. Jumpy! The ice on the door, is it gone? Yeah, it's gone! The glass must have shattered it. Yeah! Let's see if it opens. Junpei grabbed the knob and pushed with all his might. Finally, the door gave way easily and all three of them tumbled out of the freezer. Hooray! We're out! June relieved, collapsed on the, onto the floor. Move! Santa shoved past June... Junpei and ran straight to the grill, which he immediately grabbed. Ow! God damn it! Hot, hot! Fuck! He proceeded to kick the grill in a futile but amusing fit of rage. But where was Lotus? It took Junpei only a moment to find her. She was sitting on the counter, idly scratching her chest. Welcome back. I'm starting to get tired of waiting for you guys. We almost died, Lotus. Jeez. With a great yawn, Lotus lowered herself off of the counter. Junpei clenched his teeth and walked toward her. What were you doing? What do you mean? I was waiting. We were gonna die! Oh yeah? But you didn't, so everything worked out alright, didn't it? What the hell? Just kidding. It might not look like it, but I was really worried. Don't give me that crap. I'm telling the truth. I mean, if you died, then I'd be in trouble. If you died, then I'd be stuck here, and I'd die too. See? I did all I could. I even looked around to see if there was anything I could use to pry open the door. But I couldn't find anything. So all I could do was wait. I mean, what else did you want me to do? Call the cops? It was true that there weren't much she could have done, but something about her tone. Junpei grit gritted his teeth. Fine. But there's one thing I have to ask you. What's that? You didn't close the door. Did you? What? You think I closed the door on you? Why would I do something like that? It closed on its own. I told you before, if you die, then I die too. She was right, and Junpei knew it. Without them, she'd be in a very serious trouble. In very serious trouble. It seemed that an accident was the only explanation for the door's closure. If Lotus had really wanted to kill them all, she would have had to do... All she would have really had to do was borrow the door from the outside, and she hadn't. Well, she hadn't done anything. The most she was guilty of was laziness or negligence, not attempted murder. Junpei swallowed his anger and did his best to apologize. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I doubted you. Hmm? Oh, well, that's alright. As long as you understand. Lotus looked away and twirled her hair between her fingertips. His vengeance against the grill completed. Santa swaggered back toward Junpei and Lotus. Hey, no more screwing around, you two. Break time's over. Especially for you, lady. You've just been sitting on that fat ass of yours. While we were freezing to death. How rude. I was plenty busy. Yeah, yeah, how about you pull all that energy into something beside bitching? Let's go. Alright, so uh, I immediately know what to do now. Lotus, uh, not Lotus. Santa even gave us a clue when he went and ran to the air. But, uh... We have to use this and cook up this meat. Guess I'll put the meat on the grill. Hey, what are you doing? What are you going to do if the paper burns? Come on, it'll be fine. I mean, it's not like it's going to burn right away, right? We just got to keep an eye on it, and the paper will be fine. But they can argue all they want. I'm going to keep an eye on this pork. Cool, looks like it's about time. I'm going to try taking the paper out. Jumpy, be careful. Sweet of her to care, but I know what I'm... Ouch! See? I told you. What the hell are you doing? Hurry up and take the paper out. It's not coming out. This thing's frozen stiff. I can't get it out. So are we going to have to cut the meat? Yeah, looks that way. And that's why we have the freshly wet, stoned up knife. Alright. Now that I've sharpened the knife... Yes, I cut the pork. Awesome, Junpei. Now we can cut out the paper. C plus 10 plus F. OK, 
Okay, this is, has to do with the plates, right? Do you think it's some kind of code? Damn it, they're just screwing around. Jinpei, do you know what C and F stand for? You think maybe it means corporate finance? I thought it was clever and funny. <laughs> okay, so... It has to do with the damn things. And that's probably what, uh... Let me see if, uh... So... What they said was... It should be on my file, right? Is it escape tip 4? I don't know. No. I don't even know. Um, so... Man, it was written down... It has to be in here. Or can I go back to the plates and, and see something? Oh no, I mean to do that. Ten is A in hexadecimal. There are fifteen of these seafood plates. It says F on the voucher. No, no, no. 16 meat plates. 16 is written as 10 in hexadecimal. So... Wait, man, cuz... I wanted to read the note again real quick. C plus 10 plus F. Trying to think. <sighs> 
43. Okay. So it was actually pretty simple when I just did the math in my head. Um, so I was doing the hexadecimal uh, like system thing. And um, C plus 10 plus F in the hexadecimal like thing that was going on here. 10 is 16. So you just do uh, C plus 10 plus F, which is... 12 plus uh, 16 plus 15 and that then you got your answer whoo sounds like metal is falling well I guess that went well um, yeah the door opened good job jumpy thank you uh, Saturn key card Alright, and then we do this. Yes! I think it's unlocked now. You did it, Jumpy. Let's get out of here. Yeah, let's go. Escape complete. Woo! Alright. I'll end this session here. Uh, we got out of the kitchen. Next time, we'll see what we run into next. Leave a like, subscribe, share with a friend, and I'll see you then. Bye.